the War on Drugs presentation. Um, I'm Heather, Heather Haas. I'm an attorney in New York. I've, um, I'm a, obviously a harm reduction um, drug reform advocate. I work on international issues. I work closely with Harm Reduction Coalition. And um, we're going to kind of have a panel discussion um, beginning with Helen Redmond, who is an independ independent journalist um, who writes for um, this magazine, <laughs> International <laughs> Socialist Review. <laughs> Her article is available now, The War on Drugs in Afghanistan. She's an expert on, on, on the drug war in Afghanistan. And you also write for um, the English Al Jazeera. So. The war on um, drugs is really, um, it's a global war. And I think that it's easy to overlook that aspect that it's actually a global war. If you live in a country, you tend to maybe just think about the war on drugs in your own country, but really it's an international war, and the United States is really the commander-in-chief of this uh, global drug war. They're really the drug czar um, to, to, the, um, to the world, and they prosecute uh, this, wa this war in dozens of countries. They're the enforcers of drug prohibition, and drug prohibition is um, that the cultivation, the consumption, the trafficking of drugs is um, illegal in most countries. And the organizations that carry out uh, drug uh, prohibition are the, the Drug Enforcement Administration um, with the United States military, the United Nations on, on drugs and crimes, and a whole host of other uh, international uh, organizations, too many to actually name. And I like to think of them as the vampire squid on the face of humanity. I'm ri ripping off Matt Taibbi here. But um, it really fits because, you know, there's that blood funnel that the vampire squid has, and the blood, um, the, the drug war is, is nothing if not um, bloody. And so everywhere that there's a drug war um, and drug prohibition, they have a template for this war. It varies a little bit, but, but basically it is these things. It's mendacity. They lie all the time about the war on drugs, that they're winning it. It's been 50 years now. They haven't won. Hypocrisy, lots of hypocrisy. Violence, stunning amounts of violence um, where they're prosecuting the war on drugs. Corruption from the top to the bottom. The demonization of the people who are involved um, in the drug trade, uh, very prevalent. And then the profits for the few at the top of the drug chain and then prison and death and murder for those at the lower end of the, the, drug, the drug chain. And if you look at Mexico, it's really clear. Since Calderon took office in 2007, there's been 60,000 drug-related deaths. 60,000, that's like a small city. 75% are young people. Uh, people under the age of 25 are dying in the drug war there. And, of course, the drugs keep crossing borders. It doesn't stop drugs from getting into the United States or anywhere else. And really, the barbarism of this war is staggering. People probably heard about the, re the recent prison fire in Honduras. 350 people uh, were burned to death, half of the prison population. And so in Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, Colombia, those prisons are full of, of people who are involved in the drug trade, just stuffed to the bars with people uh, caught up in, in the drug war. And the reason, I think, one of the reasons why the violence is so stunning is that the profits are so astounding. So much is at stake in uh, the drug war. And I want to read a quote by Karl Marx. He wrote this um, in the 1800s, and this is what he said about, about profits. He said, capital shuns no profit just as nature abhors a vacuum. With adequate profit, capital is very bold. A certain 10% will ensure its employment anywhere. 20% certain will produce eagerness. 50% positive audacity. 100% will make it ready to trample on all human laws. 300% and there is not a crime at which it will not scruple, nor a risk it will not run, even to the chance of its owners being hanged. If turbulence and strife will bring a profit, it will freely encourage both. Smuggling and the slave trade have amply proved all that is here stated. And it's, as it, it stands today, I think, this statement, if you look at what um, these outlaw capitalists, these um, illicit capitalists, will do to make profit. So if you look at the value chain for heroin, um, the price of heroin climbs 2,000% when sold to wholesalers outside of source countries like Afghanistan. Um, $50,000 per uh, kilogram for heroin. And so you can see why um, there are 
you know, what they call drug mules, a lot of them are women actually, and they swallow condoms filled with heroin or cocaine, and they fly into the United States and other countries, and there's been stories where uh, the women arrive and they're not able to uh, essentially shit out the drugs, and the drug dealers murder them, and they cut open their stomachs, and they take out the condoms filled with heroin. That is the level that this drug war has sunk to, and so illegal drugs are worth more than gold and diamonds, if you can believe that. The illicit drug trade is worth $32.5 uh, billion. And some of the, the characters involved in the illicit drug trade, like Joaquin Guzman El Chapo in Mexico, he actually um, gets on the Forbes uh, billionaires list. He's number 1,153 on Forbes um, billionaire list. So the profits are really really incredible and it's a war without end they talk about uh, they talk about this a lot it's pretty laughable that we can create a drug-free world and they announce dates occasionally I think the last one was like 1998 they said we would live in a drug-free world and it's clear that we don't drugs are as plentiful and and actually cheaper in some countries than they've ever been and really what I, what I want to argue is that the drug warriors they need the drug war to continue now one reason is jobs you have this the vampire squid all over the globe, and they uh, employ hundreds of thousands of people. And so for them, if you end the war, right, um, you don't have those jobs anymore. And so they need them, so there's no exit strategy. Also, um, they're vested politically and ideologically in the war on drugs. And the political piece of it, I think, is really important. There's a specific role that the war on drugs plays. They have an agenda. And what it is, is it allows the United States to intervene in other countries. It's all about geopolitical influence in other parts of the world. It's a pretext for a military uh, presence. And it's about American imperialism. And they use the drug war to get into other countries. And when they do that, um, the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, they work hand in hand with the military in places like Central America, Latin America, Central Asia, in particular in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Tajikistan. They're really, they're really everywhere. And so the new report came out. It's called the International Narcotics Control Strategy Report. And the United States Department of State puts it out, the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs. There's another part of the vampire, the vampire squid. And it's really interesting. They do these country reports. So the United States has given for itself the role of judge, jury, and jailer of countries from Afghanistan to Zambia. So in this report, uh, they evaluate and they grade all of these countries um, to see if they're adhering to UN conventions and essentially to drug prohibition. Who's cooperating and who is not cooperating with the United States? And it's really interesting. They have a majors list. So I bet you can guess who's on the majors list for major drug transiting countries and drug producing countries. So of course Afghanistan is number one because they pr produce 90% of the world's opium. But you've got Myanmar on there, you've got all the countries in Central America, you've got Jamaica, you know they recently convicted um, Christopher, um, Christopher Rock from Jamaica. And over and over and over again they say in this report, it's really interesting, that this intervention, this drug war intervention in other countries is vital to the interests of the United States. They don't really spell out what that is, but I think we know what it is. And in this report, they have a, a designation. It's called failed demonstrably in the war on drugs. They haven't complied with the international drug control obligations. So Bolivia is a country that has failed uh, demonstrably. They, they expelled the DEA in 2008, which in my opinion is a success. Um, that's not a failure. And um, Myanmar failed demonstrably. They're, number, uh, they're the second largest opium cultivator now. They're right behind Afghanistan. And it's interesting, Hillary Clinton just went there, right? And um, they want to have more influence in that country. And it's going to be really interesting. The U.S. has a history of turning a blind eye to um, those in power uh, when they're involved in the drug, um, the drug war, as long as that government is in line with U.S. imperialist uh, interests. And then the other one that failed demonstra um, demonstrably was Venezuela. And in 2005, they ceased cooperation with the DEA, although um, they've allowed a couple of Venezuelans to be extradited uh, to the United States. And of course, the United States, they really hate Chavez. So the drug war is a pretext. 
the justifications evolve over time. So in Colombia, it was fighting the Marxist guerrillas, um, fighting communism. Afghanistan, um, interestingly, wasn't on the list of failed demonstrably, but they have failed demonstrably because they produce 90% of the world's opium. And uh, it's pretty stunning when you think about it because it's an incredibly poor country and they've been occupied and, and there's been a war going on for 10 years. So it tells you something about the tenacity of the Afghan people if they can continue to produce opium under really, really difficult conditions and the war on drugs. So the Afghans are the narco-terrorists. They are the new narco-terrorists. And in 2006, um, the Congress, U.S. Congress, passed the narco-terrorism stat statute, and it was directly aimed at the Afghans because they're producing so much of the opium. And uh, what this law um, allows is this, that the federal, federal drug agents have the authority to investigate narco-terrorism committed anywhere in the world if they can establish a link between a drug offense and a terrorist act or a group. And so, of course, that's always the Taliban. The Taliban are the narco-terrorists. They call them, they say the Taliban are ahead of narco-cartels, which I think is interesting. And they've extradited a number of alleged um, Afghan drug lords. I think some of them were uh, clearly involved in the drug trade in Afghanistan. If you can make profits in Afghanistan in the drug trade, of course, you're going to do it. So they extradited, and they all end up in New York for some reason. They love to bring them to New York. And uh, Bashir Norzai and Khan Mohammed were both convicted in New York and sentenced to life, to life in prison. And then Haji Juma Khan, he is not that far from here. He's in Metropolitan Correctional Center awaiting trial. He's been, I recently interviewed his lawyer, and Khan has been in solitary confinement for almost four years now. And his lawyer actually thinks that Juma Khan might get off. He thinks that the United States is changing its position towards Afghanistan and the war on drugs, which I, I don't know that I agree with. But that, that could be an interesting development. He's going to be going to trial in um, four or five months. The other important piece here, I think, is uh, in 2008, the Department of Defense modified a policy which then allowed the military, military personnel, to work with um, drug law enforcement, DEA agents, as well as um, the forces in, in other countries, and, and allow them to work together. Prior to 2008, they weren't allowed to do that, supposedly. And so now, um, joint missions, um, you know, there's joint missions, the drug raids, which are very similar to night raids in Afghanistan. This is what, this is what we're seeing. Now, I just want to talk about what the strategy in Afghanistan is. It was laid out very clearly. It's available online. It's um, a report, strategy in Afghanistan report um, for uh, 20, uh, 2010. And so here's the strategy for Afghanistan. You can this is sort of the template for the rest of the world, but Afghanistan has some differences in terms of like, you know, uh, it's not the same as Mexico. You don't have the level of cartelization. You don't have the same levels of violence, and that's because the government is not willing to prosecute a drug war like they have been in Mexico. So the first thing they want to do is they want to hire more counter-narcotics forces, as if that's what Afghanistan needs. They want to continue support for alternative livelihood programs in Afghanistan, and that's been a non-starter. That, that's not going to work in Afghanistan because 35% of the GDP is related to opium, and they're not going to, I don't believe they're going to be able to change that. They want, um, Richard Holbrook in, in 2009 stopped the policy of um, eradicating um, poppy, going into the fields and eradicating. And um, that, that's probably the only sane thing that that bully ever did. And the drug warriors did not like that at all. They want to be able to go in and eradicate. So that's, they're trying to get that back so that U.S. military forces can actually go into poppy fields and eradicate them at, at the source. They want to um, build a judicial system and lots of prisons to put um, people, put the Afghans who are involved in the drug trade in prison. This is exactly what we've seen in Central America and Latin America. They want to do um, a thing called dedicated assets for air support. In other words, they want more Chinook um, hel helicopters. They really feel to prose prosecute the, the war on drugs in Afghanistan. They need that. And by the way, one of those helicopters costs like $32 uh, million. And then they say they want to uh, prosecute corrupt Afghan officials, which is probably the most laughable thing at all because you know, from Karzai, Karzai all the way to provincial governors and everybody in between, they're all taking a piece 
of the trade. And to think that you could root out that kind of corruption is, is absolutely, I think, ludicrous. That's not going to happen. And then the last thing is now they're really concerned about the drawdown in troops in Afghanistan, if that is going to happen. So they're wondering, how will that happen and still have a DEA presence, the drug war, if the U.S. military is, in fact, going to draw down troops? Now, the DEA said they don't plan on leaving, even if U.S. military troops do. But I'm, I'm, I'm just putting this out there for people to think about. I'm wondering if, given what's just recently happened in Afghanistan, um, if that can change at all what the DEA plans on doing. Um, the fact that um, the, the, the military strategy in Afghanistan is just falling apart. Now, um, they say in this report almost every counter-narcotics operation in Afghanistan is conducted with the U.S. military. Um, and I guess I want to say right here that I, I believe in self-determination for Afghanistan, not, not only that the U.S. troops should get out of Afghanistan, and um, the occupation should end, but also that Afghanistan has the right to decide what their own drug policy is. The United States has no right to go into Afghanistan or any other country and tell them what their drug policy should be to enforce uh, prohibition. So I think it's up to the Afghans to figure out what they want to do. But I do, have, I do have a recommendation. I think that is legalization. I think the solution to the drug war is legalization and regula um, regu regulating drugs in Afghanistan. And what that means in particular for Afghanistan, because they grow 90% of the world's opium, is to license poppy farmers to grow poppy for the pharmaceutical industry. So they sell it to the pharmaceutical industry, because of course poppy is made into morphine and heroin, and those um, are drugs that are absolutely critical for human health. If anybody's had a surgery, um, they know how important uh, morphine is, um, codeine, other, other um, you know, narcotics that are derived from, from the poppy. So um, Afghan farmers should be able to grow poppy and manufacture it into morphine and to sell it um, to uh, the pharmaceutical industry. And that's exactly what farmers do in India, in Turkey, Australia, Spain. There's a number of other countries. They grow poppy legally. And so you don't have this war on drugs like you do in Afghanistan because it's actually legal and they're licensed. And then um, what, um, and they, they do have a drug problem, um, unfortunately, in Afghanistan. In Kabul, there's, last estimate was like 60,000 people who are injection drug users. Um, as you can imagine, uh, heroin is very cheap and very pure. And, uh, and what the solution to that is heroin prescription or methadone prescription. Right now, there's only one methadone program in Kabul, and uh, they're under attack by the government because they accept the U.S. prohibition and the way the U.S. believes in drug treatment, and so they don't want methadone. They think that that um, doesn't help users um, stop using drugs. But that really is the solution. And then you can go even deeper. If you're interested in preventing drug addiction, um, some of the worst or the best predictors for addiction is war and trauma, physical and sexual abuse, poverty, unemployment, and that's what Afghanistan is full of. So if you're really interested in preventing drug addiction, you're really concerned about people who, who get addicted to drugs, then you, do, you don't do those things. You don't make a war on a country. Um, the other thing about Afghanistan is they don't have a, a healthcare infrastructure they don't have pharmacies that you can just walk into. I mean, that's really a luxury. And so opium and morphine is really, for what people who live in the rural areas and even in the cities, that's the only way they have to manage pain. They can't go and get um, you know, acetaminophen or something like that. So I believe that uh, the possibility of ending the war on drugs or winning some important fundamental reforms. I, I'm more optimistic than I've been in a long time. And it's not so much um, because of, of, of Afghanistan. It's actually what's happening in Central and Latin America. And that has just started like in the last month, and uh, my co-presenters are going to talk about that. You have um, Obrador, who is one of the presidential candidates in Mexico. He's saying he's going to end the war on drugs. Right? He said, um, it's not working, and if you elect me president, I'm going to end um, the war on drugs. One of the reasons he can say that is that there's been a grassroots movement in Mexico to end the drug war, and that's been led in part by this guy, Javier Cecilia. And I heard him speak at the Drug Policy Alliance conference in November, and his son was murdered by the drug cartels. 
And he has led a movement, and there's other leaders of this movement, to stop the drug war in, in Mexico. Colombia's president, um, Juan Santos, is calling the drug war a failure and wants to see a debate on legalization. We've never heard this. We've never heard this. Well, we've heard it a little bit, but not uh, uh, on this level, I think. And so he wants to bring it up at the Summit of the Americas next month. And so he's joined in this call to debate legalization with the presidents of Costa Rica, Guatemala, and El Salvador. So once the United States got wind of that, of course, they had to send Joe Biden to Mexico and to Central America to try to say, hold on, you know, um, you, know you can't do this, and just reinforce the U.S. Uh, position around prohibition. He said, there's no way that the Obama administration is going to change its policy on legalization. And I'm taking that as word because drug prohibition has a lot of benefits for the United States, and they don't want to give those up if they can possibly uh, help it. So really, I think the question is going to be, and we'll just have to see, is will these leaders in Central and Latin America actually stand up? Will they be able to stand up to the United States uh, and actually go through with some kind of legalization or decriminalization? Uh, there's lots of ex-presidents who have said, you know, we need to legalize drugs. But when push comes to shove, will you go up against the United States? Because they have lots of ways of punishing countries that even try to decriminalize drugs. So I'll just end with the fact that, you know, they're talking about legalization is enormously important, you know, to stop the slaughter, to stop the barbarism that is always part of the drug war. So I feel more optimistic now that we can actually possibly end the war on drugs or um, really get some fundamental change. Thanks. Thank you. That was that was great. <laughs> um, our other panelists are myself and Alan Clear, the executive director of Harm Reduction Coalition. And if we seem a little jet lagged, it's because we just returned from Vienna, where the 55th session of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs was just held. And so we're going to sort of give a. You talked a lot about the world drug problem, and so often it seems like the reform efforts are domestic reform efforts in America and the rest of the world. And so we're going to kind of, I think our discussion will kind of show how, how those um, really are one and the same or should be more um, integrated and sort of what the climate of drug reform is at the UN and at the international level. The way we address global drug policy and the, the heavy-handed architects of the war on drugs in the US and the, the way they prosecute it. At the same time, there's been uh, a, an international infrastructure that's been set up around it, the bureaucracy of the war on drugs. And that goes back 100 years to the Opium Conventions and, um, and has been built over time till um, like 1960. Two, one, it's 1961. Mm -hmm. um, and then development of the single convention, which compiled all the conventions together so that um, the, the countries of the world, states of the world, actually had a framework by which they could address um, drug policy. Um, so before we get to that, though, I want to actually two thoughts. One is that Evan probably knows more about Latin America than any of us here, possibly. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, all right. <laughs> I could, maybe, could you could talk about some of the stuff maybe that, uh, that Ethan's been doing, mm -hmm. if you've spoken to Ethan? Um, um, well, I have. Well, I'm in the Drug Policy Alliance and working with our harm reduction coalition. Mm -hmm. We work on national policy uh, to end war on drugs. Um, and our executive director, Ethan Nadelman, who uh, really spawned um, this, this movement in, in the 80s and early 90s around having drug policy be on the national level, increasingly the international level, uh, has been going down to Latin America to have conversations uh, with high-level um, leaders in Latin America around uh, drug prohibition and its failures. And a lot of that conversation has come from uh, the Global Commission on Drugs, which um, uh, Helen, I'm sorry, is that here? Mentioned that a number of former world leaders, including that uh, spearheaded by former president, uh, president of Brazil, Fernando Cardozo, um, had been calling for alternatives to the global drug prohibition regime. And as a result of sort of these leaders coming together in this commission, Richard Branson is also part of this, uh, Paul Volcker, and a number of other high level former leaders, a number of current Latin American presidents have 
have decided to become public and talk about uh, what are the alternatives to the war on drugs in Latin America. Because one of the things that isn't often talked about, um, we talk about Mexico all the time and the violence there, but a lot of these countries in Latin America do not even have a strong um, governmental function. And there is risk that a lot of these countries in Latin and, and, and Central and Latin America, well, I'd say more Central America, like Guatemala um, and Venezuela, not Venezuela, but um, can actually be, uh, it's more of a security threat. And so these, because of that, there has been a lot of conversation uh, over the last, uh, say, two weeks by, by high-level officials and presidents in, in Latin America and Central America around what the alternatives are. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah. <laughs> and Global Commission, was that uh, CMB also? The way the war on drugs is being used in the United States as a, a mechanism to incarcerate, over-incarcerate people, predominantly people of color, from, um, um, you know, due, due to, fuck my brain. <laughs> it's like, we just spent a whole bit. If you're in Vienna, at this mission lock on drugs, you sort of go through this reality barrier, and you sort of float in this bubble for a week and like not know what's going on you wonder what you're looking at when you're looking at it it's uh it's this it's it's bureaucracy and it's diplomacy and action and you, you sort of like go into this other realm and then we got back last night and our brains are completely fried um and we're <laughs> used to like reality yeah um so the war on drugs in this country is to me it's been a way of it's been a way of dividing communities it's been a way of targeting certain communities as a way of dividing uh, the U.S. There's been very little resistance to it over, over the decades it's been put into place. Uh, even though it was Nixon that sort of started it as, uh, you know, as a sort of a, I think as a counter response to protests of the Vietnam War and, and civil dissent in this country, it was really under Reagan that the mass incarceration took off. And um, like I say, despite that, there's been very, very little resistance to that. And to my way of thinking, the crisis that came that began to uh, sort of criticize the war on drugs is when um, drugs met HIV. So that's when the AIDS crisis at the end of the 80s came along and suddenly you, you were seeing the, the result of, um, you know, lack of style syringes on the street, over incarceration. It, um, you know, created an AIDS crisis amongst drug injectors, which accidentally brought public health into the picture so that people began to say, well, hang on, how come this is happening in this way? At the same time as everyone was saying, probably Ethan Edwin and Linda Smith-Santo and the Drug Policy Alliance, uh, at the same time there was a Drug Policy Foundation, began to criticize uh, the war on drugs in this country and look at alternatives. Um, so this... What has occurred to me over the time, I mean, this started in the late 80s, and we got to this place where we are now, where we're beginning to have um, people looking at alternatives to prohibition, beginning to look at legalizing marijuana in Colorado and Washington State. We've got medical marijuana in so many different states. We've got governments in other countries beginning to look at this. But it's taken, uh, the war on drugs didn't happen overnight. It took a long time to get to this place, and it's also taken a long time to undo this. So. The, the, the parallel processes to this is the undoing of the war on drugs at the bureaucratic level too, um, which is incredibly, um, it, it's, it's so slow, um, but there is actually progress being made. Now, the debate, which is why I started what I was saying a minute ago, the debate is whether or not it matters whether or not there's a, yeah, multilateral organizations addressing the war on drugs from UNAIDS to UNODC and WHO, whether that matters at all or whether it can just happen, just like the Berlin War, it all falls down, countries legalize drugs, everyone forgets a single convention, or whether that process goes back and forth and you begin to undo it on both ends. That you begin to look at what happens in Colorado and Washington State, you begin to look at what happens in Guatemala, um, and other countries begin to address the war on drugs and, and see perhaps that, and Heather would talk about the situation in Bolivia and how that's cracked open the single convention sort of in one go. Um, and, and you know, whether or not you go back and forth and that's the way you do it, or whether it just all falls apart uh, and we don't know. So we're, part of what we've been doing over the last few years is going to 
uh, the core of the architects of the bureaucracy of it, which is, has been dominated, as Helen said, by the U.S. The U.S. created it. But the U.S. at this point um, is not the main driver of the bureaucracy of the war on drugs. It actually, to our mind, I can't speak to that. That's a really good point. Yeah. The U.S. is actually trying to undo some of that bureaucracy in ways that Russia, for example, is completely adamantly opposed to. So whereas the U.S., and this is why it's so glacial, the moves, is because the U.S. Or, and, and the European Union and other countries and you know, a, a few other states around the world have, have begun to move the dialogue in a different direction, uh, but can only go so far because it's a consensus-based process. So they have to move um, very slowly, and that, and that Russia and uh, Chinese, for example, will slow it down because you cannot have, they will not allow human rights uh, language in United Nations resolutions because they'll argue it to death. Um, so that's the sort of where we've been operating recently on the, on the international stage. Um, <laughs> but the, the when Helen brought up the 1998, that was the United Nations General Assembly special session on drugs that occurred, and that's where the phrase came up, a drug-free world, we can do it, and it was supposed to, we were supposed to have a drug-free world by 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, and that didn't quite happen <laughs> on the schedule. Uh, so we've, there's civil society, which, you know, is the, theoretically the counterpoint to the states, have been much more engaged in the process of developing global, or having discussion about global drug policy since 2008, really, where we developed a, an alternative political declaration to that would come out of the UN General Assembly special session. That's when it was reviewed in 2000, actually 2009. And since that time, we've been going to be in and working our way into in, into creating a voice for civil society at this at the UN level, and that's been the challenge because they don't want us there. And so we've been, that's, that's what we've been doing, that's what we came back to, um, came, just came back from uh, last night. So you want to? Well, you want me to, maybe I'll clarify some of the you know, yeah. reasons why the law takes so, takes so long to change. A lot of people don't realize that there's a, you know, the, does everybody know about the 1961 single convention on narcotic mm -hmm. drugs? It's basically, um, you know, it, it prohibits the use of um, opiates, cannabis, um, for throughout the world for all the 100. It, I think it was last count, 184 countries that belong to it. So, legalization is not um, is there is no le there is no drug legalization anywhere in the world right now. Like people think that in Holland, um, cannabis is legal, but that's not really true. It's it's that they have a policy of non enforcement not that it's just legal. They have laws on their books that prohibit the use of cannabis, but they don't enforce them. And same with um, uh, Portugal. I mean, not the same, but it's a, they have a policy of decriminalization, which belongs in sort of a gray area under the treaties. So the point is that in order to legalize a drug um, like marijuana here, you would have to um, work outside the convention. Um, you'd have to amend the convention, which at this point, would be nearly impossible because of the bureaucracy involved. Um, one of the one of the things that's happened in the last couple of years that shows just how difficult this is is the Bolivian situation with the coca leaf. Um, does it, does does anybody know about that? Have you heard about the Bolivian coca leaf? In fact, we have some here. <laughs> Bolivia, who was um, a party to the to the sixty one convention, as most countries are. The Bolivian coca leaf, as you might know, um, is has been used for uh, for a very very long time in Bolivia uh, for chewing, for um, for coca tea, um, for cooking. There are a lot of traditional uses medicinal of, use. of the yeah medicinal use of the coca leaf in Bolivia. And um, in the sixty one convention, it was the, it was it basically said that the coca leaf must be a the coca leaf chewing must be abolished. But since it was so ingrained in the Bolivian society, it was, they, um, the convention gave the Bolivians 25 years to phase it out. <coughs> so the convention went into effect in 64, so by 1989 it was not phased out at all. <laughs> in fact, it had really ramp, um, ratcheted up. 
And by 2008, I think, Bolivia decided to enact a um, amendment to its constitution that said that uh, Bolivians were protected under the constitution and that the chewing of the coca leaf was legal in Bolivia. And it gave the Bolivian government four years to work it out with the international community. So Bolivia, the Bolivian government is in a conflict right now between its own laws and the um, international convention which says that they, that they must abolish it. And at this point, I think the abolishment of the coca leaf would be it would be um, absurd, as even Morales put it. So, in the opening session of the of the um, meeting, where we just were, Ivo um, Morales came in and he had this little purse. <laughs> <laughs> he made a very good presentation. Um, you know, basically saying a plea to other countries for support. Basically saying that um, that Bolivia was committed to the conventions. They're committed to Prohibition, basically. Um, they're committed to fighting trafficking. They're committed to it in every other way, but that they, um, that they, would like everyone to understand that you know the the traditional coca leaf should be accepted from the convention, basically. And he pulled out the coca leaves, and then he pulled out a whole line of products. <laughs> yeah. he, there's like coca tea and bottled coca drinks and coca candy, coca candy, coca liquor. Coca liqueur, yeah, and um, coca marmalade. <laughs> so that was really interesting. But the point of that is that that amendment, um, Bolivia first asked for, um, applied for an amendment to the 1961 convention to change that article dealing with the coca leaf. And it, amendments have to be passed unanimously by, um, by the commission. So the United States led a group called Friends of the Conventions, and basically re shot that down. Shot it down, so they can't. So then Bolivia decided to um, instead withdraw from the convention. And this is like the first time there's been, um, there's ever been a challenge like that to the conventions. All other things like um, non-enforcement, like in Holland, or decriminalization are considered soft challenges to the treaties, it, or, because they, they fit within the gray area. They're still in, the countries are still in compliance with the treaties, but they're not, um, you know, not really within the spirit of the treaties. But Bolivia has gone way out there and asked for an amendment, and now has withdrawn, and is going to reexcede with the reservation. Um, and the reservation would take, will basically become uh, valid unless it's. Well, actually, it's valid unless the um, unless one third of the member countries to the conventions object to it within a year. So that's just kind of an example of how difficult it is to sort of get around the treaties. So if, if for example, in the United States, cannabis were legalized in, um, in a state, then the United States federal government would be in a very big bind because it would have to, it would be, you know, the United States is approaching violation of the treaties at this point. And the other point that you made is that even though um, the United States kind of started this process in motion and definitely was the driver of of creating this system that we have, it's not it's not the only driver now. So even if the United States, in my opinion, were to say, um, you know, we've ha we've decided to take a different approach, which in some respects I think they kind of are, um, it would be difficult to even uh, even a United States initiated amendment would be difficult to get passed. So there are a lot of there are a lot of impediments to 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 changing um, to legalization or changing the law. There are a lot of it, there's a reason why the whole system works really slowly, and there's a reason why the federal government is so adamant against legalization because it's not it it doesn't work under the conventions. Yeah, if you if you if you enjoy watching diplomacy and bureaucracy, it's it's a weird thing to watch because it's like. You have all this stuff happening in Latin America, and presidents outrightly saying we want to legalize drugs, and that's what we're going to do because it's a national security issue for us. And then you have President Morales of Bolivia speaking, who you know is no was not viewed friend, as a friendly government by the U.S. anyway because of where it came from. But his speech at the UN was like really 
it start it had this whole arc of like you know we are a good country we abide by the conventions we actually want to stop the exportation of coca we want to destroy coca leaves except for the amount, the amount of coca we want to chew uh, and then he went into but this is our culture and we're not going to we're not going to take this that when the convention was signed by our country it was an illegitimate military dictatorship that the rest of the world supported uh, and we, we cannot abide by that and we've changed our national constitution and we use coca culturally uh, he was actually saying we abide by the conventions we support the war on drugs but we want our coca to chew at the same time and this was never mentioned at any point in the last week um, the, the drug legalization debate is coming from presidents in the same region. So theoretically, Bolivia will be our only friend in Latin America, our, uh, the US's only friend in Latin America, uh, if you base it upon what was being said publicly on all extremes, uh, which is pure, I mean, obviously not going to happen like that whatsoever. You know, the, the UN system too is really, uh, this whole, no, let me say back. This, this whole thing is purely, obviously, political. Um, Canada was a very friendly government to, you know, progressive drug policy stuff to a degree, and they very actively supported harm reduction. Then they changed government, and the Harper administration comes in, and it now wants to institute, you know, mandatory minimum drug you have in the states, which didn't work. The, the UK and Holland have gone to a conservative place where they're no longer as uh, friendly to progressive drug policies they once were. You know, if Spain changes government, it's going to change the other way again. The U.S., like I said, has actually been a pretty friendly government. When we started going there four years ago, we could not meet with them. And that's actually what, partly why I started going to Vienna, because we could not talk to the Office of National Drug Control Policy down in Washington. So we went to Vienna to hound them in the corridors. And they, they, they were scared. They were scared of us. Uh, and now they're very friendly, which doesn't make them a wonderful government. But you, you know from conversations we have with them that they actually don't necessarily believe in all the things that they're sort of um, carrying out in some ways. Which, which is, in, in some ways they're required to carry out because of the conventions. I mean, yeah. I think that's, that they, they really, they're, even if they didn't believe in prohibition, there's nothing that they can really do. And um, just, I mean, working with them. Yeah, with publicly. Publicly. Yeah. Uh, but then you have the... And Heather, maybe I can explain it better than I can. The Commission on Narcotic Drugs is a committee of the United Nations. The body that carries out the resolutions that get passed, the uh, UN resolutions that get passed by the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, are uh, implemented by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. That has, that has an executive director. The executive director now there is Russian. Um, so it's clearly he, he's much more aligned with the Russian position, even though he won't admit it. Um, the previous guy was uh, Italian and um, a little bit loopy and nutty, but at least he could talk about harm reduction and drug legalization. He didn't necessarily agree with it. Whereas the guy we have there now is, is you know, you ask him, can, do, can you, do you support methadone? He says, well, I support doctors prescribing it. So you're like, well, doctors can't prescribe it in Russia. He says it's up to states to decide. But you're the head of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. You know the science. I am not a scientist. And, and it's, it, it goes around and around like this. There's, there's the regulatory body that theoretically, although it has no power whatsoever, is the International Narcotics Control Board, which is it keeps states in line with the international drug conventions. We question him on death penalty in certain countries, state executions. He says it's not his business, basically. And under UN treaties, actually, it is his business, and he's actually acting uh, outside of international law. At one point, I said, is there not an atrocity um, that you could see yourself actually responding to, whether it's extrajudicial, extrajudicial killings, death penalties, forced labor camps, um, torture? He said no. And this is, a, you, you're watching this, and these very gray, gray men saying they're not, that, that nothing can move them uh, outside of this. So the, this whole structure there, which is the international proxy of the war on drugs, has to be, I don't know what you, I mean, you push it, and you push yeah, it, and you push it, uh, so you can move it just that much. And, and, it, and it, it does move, it's moved, it's moved 
in the last four years and it's moved over the last 12 years because even 12 years ago the big discussion was whether or not demand reduction which is sort of like drug treatment drug education that wasn't a legitimate aspect of uh, global drug policy four years ago harm reduction which harm reduction is the basically the public health approach to the war on drugs where it accepts that drug use takes place uh, services help social um, situations are addressed without demanding cessation of drug use or accept that drugs take place. Uh, drug users will always exist, that you that there's healthier ways of using drugs than others. Uh, that, that, that debate at the UN was it's so polarizing that it actually got, it was in the WikiLeaks how, you know, in the WikiLeaks cables how the US was trying to get at the UK delegate to stop her you know, she was like the, it, at one point it was like the European Union was like the little, the, the Chinese guy in Tiananmen Square with the tanks. <laughs> you know, harm reduction goes into the political declaration of the UN. And in the end it lost. It was like the Pope, the Holy See came out against it, against it. harm reduction facilitates death. Then the Italians came out and that broke the European Union. It was, uh, but for once, it was like to have states stand up and say we support harm reduction. And this, like I said before, this is a consensus-based process. At the end of this discussion around a political declaration that was put out in 2009, 26 states said we, we can't support... Actually, what they did say is that the term uh, and other related services which appears in this political declaration means harm reduction to them. So that was, that was a political battle that actually took place at the UN, which you know, moved it forward and it, um, and you, it's, you'd sit there and you listen to the babble of people go on and on about... And what, like they have to change every single word, they have to go over every single word in the yeah. document and make sure... And change every it. single comment, every <laughs> single colon. But you, you'll see a, a more... You, you'll see people, def cut states defining themselves by what they do in terms of drug policy. So at different points you have it, the Romanians will suddenly say, and we support harm reduction because it's, it's moving it forward and it's digging at certain countries. But you have, like I was saying, you've got the, you got the political makeup of UNODC now has moved towards support, you know, a balanced approach which means it's more aligned with the Russians. You have INCB which is not going to go anywhere. And it, 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 is, it does, it's, like I say, I now sound like an apologist, but the US is actually a reasonable voice within the UN for pushing drug policy in a certain direction. Well, like you said, there's this whole, um, there's a sort of dichotomy right now, it, whether drug, um, drug policy is going to change, um, is it going to fall down like the Berlin Wall, or whether it's going to sort of change little by little, like from either side, and, you know, it kind of remains to be seen with it, what's going to happen. Just, I guess, to clarify the, the whole, you know, the thing about the resolutions and the political de declaration, you know, you have the, the conventions, which are very old and very you know, unchangeable <laughs> in they're, a way. They're younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> and then uh, you have what um, Alan is kind of referring to as the resolutions that are passed every year by the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. And, like, they pass about 10, 10, 15 resolutions every year by different countries. And that is how we're talking about, like, incremental change happens. So we had some victories on inter incremental change this year at, at CND. Well, I'll talk about the one that happened last year. Right, and the one that happened this year. So last year there was a. Actually, I'll talk about the political declaration, which is kind of a resolution, right? It's a resolution is a non-binding um, statement of policy, basically. Don't you think? I mean, mm -hmm. like it's, it's a statement of their official policy. So it's used as precedential in like for precedential value going forward, and for interpretive um, guidance. So you know, if there's a dispute later on, um, you can refer back to the resolutions and say, but. Um, say, but um, a certain measure was approved earlier, and so it's basically a statement of a statement that you know to see and C and D approves it. Anyway, in 2009, the political declaration was signed of, about that you were talking about that doesn't actually um, say harm reduction, but what, what's this phrase it uses? It's and other related services. And other related services. So, in a way, though, that opened the door for harm reduction to be included. Um, in UNODC's um, implementation of the 
in, in their programs. I mean, when you say since then, harm reduction has basically become an accepted mm -hmm. um, thing. When back then, the year that that was that that was passed, harm reduction was almost like a dirty, you know, dirty word. Oh, it's a bad, bad phrase. And now it's like a like everybody. It's like harm reduction is hip at um, at the UN level. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, UNODC has documents now that say harm reduction in them. And so last year, there was a resolution on civil society or basically nonprofits that show up at CND to um, to influence the country's delegates, and the resolution basically encouraged uh, recognized the the value of um, collaborating with with civil society and the, with the member states in civil society, right? Mm -hmm. And so this year, that passed last year, which was a big victory for the nonprofit um, community, the NGO community. And so this year, there's been a lot of um, discussion about, I mean, I think the theme this year basically was involvement of civil society. So that's a big step forward because before that, it's just the member states who are, you know, talking amongst themselves and the civil society were pulling them aside in the hallways and trying to get them to listen to them. And now it's sort of like, it's recognized that that members of um, NGOs get to speak to um, the head of the UNODC or the INCB, you know, etc. So, anyway, this year the big um, the big step forward, although incremental, was that there was um, a resolution passed on overdose prevention. So the resolution would. Why don't, do you want to talk a little bit about what the resolution? What you're understanding about the resolution? Yeah, it's I mean because it, and it, this is sort of our attempt of, uh, because we actually can't undo completely the war on drugs. Is like actually work, working within the infrastructure that exists right now. Is that we that there was a resolution that ended up being introduced by the Czech Republic, um, and it came up with five things. One was that the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime will develop best practices on drug overdose prevention. Um, that it would then disseminate that information to member states. It would provide technical assistance to countries that want to start overdose prevention. Uh, it would pro provide money for it if there was any money. And I feel like there was something else too as a fifth thing. Um, but this is as a result of I mean, Mike does it here in New York City. I mean, um, does we've developed in the U.S. a system of doing overdose prevention with people who use heroin and other opiates, of so putting tools in the hands of drug users so they can actually respond to a drug overdose themselves. Yeah, and I can. Um, so we so we introduced the word naloxone into this resolution, which had never appeared before, and you should have seen it was like they. The discussions around what this means uh, in terms of introducing the Oxone into, the, into this resolution was, uh, no one understood what it meant. The UK was opposed to it, Greece wanted it out, Italy wanted it out, and they found out they sell it over the counter. Then they wanted families to have it. The Dutch wanted it out, uh, and it was all negotiated in, in the, and the US said leave it in, and the Russians said leave it in as well. The, so it was, yeah, uh, so in terms of actually saving lives and things, this is a massive thing because it now means that countries are supposed to think about drug overdose when they develop their drug strategies, and if they want help in reducing drug overdose in their countries, they can actually get assistance for it. And it's like the, the work that we really pioneered in this country has now gone global in, as a cheerful... Officially. Yeah, officially. Yeah, officially. Yeah, officially as a cheerful little piece of the war on drugs, that was a major, major thing. Um, and the United States um, did not uh, oppose it, which is... No, that she meant they were more helpful than mm -hmm. hurtful, and they facilitated actually the, the progress of this resolution. It's actually, it sailed through. We mm -hmm. expected it to be really controversial, and it didn't, it wasn't at all. And I really wonder if that's because the United States, you know, didn't... Yeah, it was, part, and that's the influence of, oh, we should still say, we didn't say this yet, if the... The whole drug policy, global drug policy is purely about the US, Russia, European Union, and to a minor extent China. Everything, everyone else is a proxy of those countries. If you can get to one or two of those, you can actually affect global drug policy. And that's sort of what we're really working on, actually. It boils down to it. Yeah.
Maybe that. <laughs> maybe, maybe that was a good ending. Yeah, we maybe pretend we that's the end of the presentation. <laughs> what would you suggest as a way to challenge the demonization of, of marijuana and cannabis and all that sort of thing? It seems to me that the, the demonization is somewhat arbitrary and lacking in scientific foundation. There was a, this is really interesting. At at C and D this year, the, there, for the first time, there was a they, they have these side events. You know, they're like lunch meetings or presentations, and um, one of them was called the Future of the Conventions. The, the people putting it on sought to, to invite um, delegations, head, you know, heads of member countries to participate in discussion with NGOs about, you know, what's going to happen with these conventions. Um, and they show a lot of them showed up, which was really surprising. <laughs> and the U.S. was there from ONDCP. And towards the end of this presentation, someone said, um, "Well, let's let's call a spade a spade. I mean, cannabis is what we're talking about here. That's where the vulnerability of the conventions are is because that's you know that's that's the issue that is that is rising up everywhere. It's sort of boiling, you know, in a lot of different countries and especially in the United States." And that's the one issue that, you know, cannabis, the use of cannabis is, recreational use of cannabis is prohibited under the convention. So um, I'm just going to say that that was the beginning of the discussion. I've never, I've never heard of members of, you know, that, that group, that kind of group of people being together in a room talking about this. And I, I wouldn't say that anything concrete came to light, but they did, you know, the issue was thrown out there and recognized. Um, Oh, go ahead. As far as as far as um, what would I suggest? What I would suggest? I would suggest following the example put forth by the harm reduction um, a community in showing up to international negotiation, even if it's not on the table right now. There should be a presence of of reformers. Should you know try and try and get involved with the international community and and, and just see what the process is about and start showing a presence. Uh, I would say actually, the science will always be denied at that level until it's accepted at the U.S. by the U.S. government. That as long as long as the U.S. denies the science around marijuana, um, then it won't go anywhere. And it, it's probably true for even if the U.S. accepted the science, you, you then you've got to get other member states to do the same thing. So it's it's really as well as doing it in Vienna or Geneva. You have to do it at the local, uh, with the national governments. Getting the European Union to agree that there's scientific value to medical marijuana or that there's you know, no strong reason as to why marijuana should be legal to begin with, um, that's got to happen at the state level so that it can happen at the global level. And vice versa. And that, that's what I was saying at the beginning. You have global war on drugs, and you can, you've got to go back and forth and do it both in both places. Um, uh, two, two quickies. Re this is regarding the efforts of uh, Guatemala, Costa Rica, and Colombian presidents. There are two things they could do. One thing they could say to the United States, how would you like if Saudi Arabia tried to impose alcohol prohibition in the non-Muslim world, which is basically the same principle. The other thing is, Bolivia's talked about leaving the single convention. Could the presidents of Guatemala, Honduras, and Colombia say we're going to consider leaving the single convention? Would that would that cause shockwaves? <coughs> would it be like a nine? Would it be like nine point nine on the Richter scale times you know nine hundred ninety nine trillion? I don't know if it's that much. <laughs> <laughs> would that be shockwaves through you know the prohibitionist world? I mean, maybe that's what they're leading up to. You know, I'm not really sure, but I think that that would send shockwaves through the. It, it would be a, it would be a big deal since Bolivia, um, Bolivia's temporary withdrawal from the conventions was a huge deal. The the only way it can be done is through collective. If the if the three countries all all of a sudden wanted to leave, that would be. Yeah, I mean, this has been moving in that direction for a while because I think Argentina amended drug laws, Brazil did. Uh, yeah. Mexico did so that was the first step. Now you've got people outrightly talking about countries that are outrightly talking about drug legalization. So there's safety in numbers because Bolivia was very isolated and they got attacked by everyone, uh, and so they, you know, that was the issue there. But it's with more countries coming up, 
um, together and saying we challenge this, then that's that's their safety there, and they can't be they can't be taken down as easily. If enough countries leave it, and there are only there are few, I think it's fewer than forty countries remain, then it then it falls into disuse, or it's it's no longer valid. Go ahead. What will probably happen if Washington and Colorado legalize? marijuana this year? Will it just be a total suppression from the federal government or will they actually go through it and if they do, what are the consequences? Two, you keep using the record over and over, failed war, failed war. For somebody who is a, a medical marijuana patient who really needs it and they're living in a horrible place like New York, in which it is simply impossible, even if they wanted to, to get it on the illegal market, that if you say it's failed because it's freely available despite prohibition, that really flies in the face of reality. After all, who is going to want to, in a place like the Bronx, even seek out some illegal dealer to get medical marijuana from when they see somebody like Ramarley Graham being murdered in cold blood in their own house? First of all, they don't know of any dealers. They're totally cut off. You know, some person in the 50s who's really sick and needs their medical marijuana. So to say that the war on drugs has failed to such a people, person is a really cruel thing because if it had so badly failed, he would be able to go without any problem to the street corner, score a dime bag, and not have any problems with the police and he would laugh off prohibition. But this is not the case when people are being murdered. So you got to cool it on this failure of the war on drugs. It's nothing but cruelty to the medical marijuana patient who can't get their medicine here in New York because their condition isn't covered even by the proposed law and the, that in the Albany legislature, mm -hmm. and the legislature won't even in, uh, pass it. It's cruel to them because as they're being told, oh, we're going to pass it, and then they find out that they're cut out because they don't have the right disease. You know, what will happen when uh, a state legalizes marijuana on an right. international level. Right. And that's a really interesting legal question anyway. I mean, I think it's a really interesting question that people don't really, you know, nobody really knows. But um, I think that basically if a state were to legalize marijuana, okay, the, the conventions um, require each federal government, each country to, um, to, to criminalize possession of marijuana. So there, this is kind of a, I'm sure there are arguments in a couple different, you know, looking at this from a couple different ways, but if the, if the state were to legalize marijuana, I don't think the federal government would be in instant violation of the treaties just that, just because the state has the law, but it kind of depends on how the, the um, national government would react to that. I mean, it, the, the administration would be in a, in a big bind because, because we're required to, to criminalize possession of marijuana. So. We could, the federal government could follow a policy of non enforcement like Holland and just um, turn a blind eye, but that would do, dam do a lot of damage, I think, to its reputation internationally. So I think probably they would come down hard on people, on anybody who, would, who possesses marijuana in those states. So you basically think that the Washington and Colorado initiatives are just giving people false hopes? Well, it's a step forward for that. If, if you, you know, if you want, legalization of marijuana is a step forward for that um, issue, but as a practical matter, it doesn't change anything because the federal government can still prosecute someone who possesses marijuana. It would, it, it, what, would, what would put the United States into um, a, 
uh, a big legal, bigger legal bind is if these two, there, I think there are two federal bills that would legalize or reschedule marijuana. And if that happened, if either one of those were to pass, which is probably a long ways off into the future anyway, but if either one of those were going to pass, then, then the United States would be in violation of its treaty obligations. Well, real question is whether people are going to be able oh, to get cannabis is if those bills pass, if they can't get it, then the whole thing was a lie and, a little, and an illusion. If they can get it, then that's real progress. But, you know, I don't like it when people always tell me, you're going to get your freedom soon, and then you don't get your freedom, you don't get nothing, you just get beaten on the head some more. Well, I think that the pro one issue is that um, people in the States are not really aware of this, the international laws about marijuana. I think the reason we talk about failure, um, the war on drugs is failure, because it really is. And it's a way to point out the hypocrisy where the United States government keeps saying, you know, we're making progress. If you look at their own data, you can see that they're not. So the, the rate of drug use it either remains the same, same or, or it trends up and down. Um, prices have fallen. So I think it's important to say that their war on drugs has failed. But also to add, it's a war on people. The war on drugs is a war on people, so I think that's, that's important. I'm, so, I'm sorry, the United States government is conducting a war on people who need um, medical marijuana. Really but wait a minute, wait, wait, let, me, let me finish. I think um, the other thing I just wanted to add to something Alan was saying earlier was um, maybe people know this, but the DEA actually schedules all drugs and um, marijuana is in Schedule 1, which says it has no medicinal purposes, which is absolutely ludicrous. So that would be another way, maybe another way, a chink in the armor if we could get you know, that um, rescheduled so that it was in another category where it, it, it clearly has medical use. I mean, there's, I don't know, 20, 25 years of studies that it is. I wanted to say something. I wanted to ask people here, but also um, it's about Mexico and, and Central America because given the recent development, so at the Drug Policy Alliance conference um, in Los Angeles in November, there was a delegation of uh, Mexicans who came, and it was really great to have them there. And they said very unequivocally that they felt that the war on drugs in Mexico was almost always used as a pretext to go into other states and stop indigenous movements and stop people from fighting. It was the reason they could go in. You're drug dealers, you're terrorists, you're this, you're that. And so they were very clear about that. And so I wonder, um, you know, AMLO is saying this, uh, Vicente Fox, who's a former president, he's now for it. I'm wondering if they really will um, come out for legalization, given the fact that in Mexico, like in the United States, the war on drugs has a lot of benefits to it. Even though it harms a lot of people, the people at the top of society have get enormous benefits. It divides people. It demonizes who we can blame those people for all our social problems. It, it's those drug users. So I guess what I'm asking, in Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, the murder and mayhem in those countries is so staggering is the war on drugs, is it still worth doing that? Are they getting enough benefit? Or it, what is the calculation now in, in Central America? It's a powerful thing to oppress people. Can they give it up and still have ways to oppress people in Central America? I guess that's what I'm wondering. I don't have the answer to it. Oh. <laughs> Um, that's a really interesting question because I always wonder if they really, if the U.S. really believes in all of these um, concepts, or if it's, there's another mm -hmm. um, purpose to it. But I just wanted to follow up quickly on something that you said about um, rescheduling. The, the the conventions and and the um, and the Controlled Substances Act in the United States have basically similar schedules. So the the DEA schedules um, drugs under the um, Controlled Substances Act as they are scheduled internationally, so they correspond, and to change it internationally would also be this huge international process. Um, I think it's, it, had to be do, it would have to be done on recommendation of the World Health Organization, and um, along with the majority of the member country vote of the Commission on Narcotics Drugs. So also an extremely lengthy 
complicated process. So we had other questions. So how much of the Obama administration's resistance to considering any other options do you think is due to the ease of getting himself reelected and you know avoiding creating a, a controversy that might hurt him at the polls at this point in a, in a tight race? Uh, compared with these international entanglements that seem almost inextricable, is there any chance we might see something move in the second term once he, 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 once he can't run a th third time? So mm -hmm. That's a great question because in 2009 when the political declaration with the harm reduction issue um, came about, we were, everybody remember everybody was waiting to see what, um, what President Obama would do and was a little... Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I tend to think that we actually will see, if, it, if he gets re-elected, we'll, we'll see a little bit more change. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it works. I, mean, it's, I actually think, you know, they, there's a number of issues that they talk about, right? So prescription drugs is a big issue in this country, and one of the, the arguments against prohibition is, well, if you took away the illicit market, then no one would have any drug problems, or right? they wouldn't overdose. So well, you actually have prescription drugs here, and we do have drug problems, and we do have people dying of drug overdose. So they actually are generally perplexed, or generally don't think that um, legalizing drugs will actually have some of the same benefits that people who are anti-prohibitionists think it will. So I think that they're, they're trying to work their way through that. But I think that we will, one of the things they, they talk about a lot is alternatives to incarceration, but the model they're promoting now is a short, sharp, shop model of uh, like, well, if you if you take a piss test and you've got drugs in your system, we'll put you in jail overnight. And there's a program in Hawaii they've been studying, and they say that has benefits. However, uh, in, in Seattle, Washington, which is where Kolakowski the drugs are is from, they have now started uh, this policy of, uh, and they've started it, and the police are, uh, if you get, busted for drugs under, I think it's under three grams of virtually any drug, you do not go to jail or prison at all. If you don't have a drug problem, you basically wander off. If you have an issue you want taken care of, you can go to treatment, you get, theoretically you get housing, they don't have any housing unless you get stuck in a hotel. Um, and like no one, so, so therefore they're like the, the addiction to putting people in prison begins to go away. Um, and this, the benefits of social services then get applied. But simultaneously to this program being started by the Defender Association, you know, Defender Association up there, the police stopped arresting people. They've seen a, a decrease of 65% in drug arrests in Seattle. And it actually came at simultaneous time to the Occupy movement in Seattle. So there was like a change in resources. Well. Kodakowski and the ONDCP are very aware of this program. They say it's not far enough along to say it's successful. I can imagine a situation where in a couple of years' time you get our dr national drugs on saying, look, no more jailing of people for under a certain amount, which is de facto decriminalization. But they can't say decriminalization. They'll just say no more rest, no more jail. And um, that's the way they'll back their way out of it because then once they back their way out of it domestically, they can back their way out of it internationally. But it can only work if the political system as it now is stays in place if Santorum gets elected or, you know, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Are psychedelics as entangled in, the, in these international treaties as drugs of abuse that were well known in 1961? Yeah, because they got introduced in like 1968. Oh, um, so it's still yeah, but they don't appear in the dialogue very much at all. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, no. Oh, were you, were you uh, no, no. Uh, um, what does the U.S. stand to lose if they back out from the treaty, if they would withdraw? Like, why are they so afraid of doing that? that that's a great question. We've asked ourselves that many <laughs> times. I mean, right now they're apparently not. Oh, you know what we should mention is another resolution that came about this, that was passed this year was one that was introduced by the United States called the 100-Year Celebration of the Hague Opium Convention. And they put on a side event with the heads of um, UNODC and INCB in which they talked about the achievements of the, of the, um, of the convention. So it's odd that, um, that the administration on DCP is standing behind, uh, not only standing behind the conventions, but 
promoting, reaffirming and promoting their adherence to them. So that's probably not going to happen anytime soon. But if it did, um, prob they would probably have fewer consequences to the United States than, you know, say, a, a country like Bolivia would have. Um, it's just, that's a, that's a, it's, that's unknown, basically. <laughs> yeah, it would just cause it It would cause a huge stir, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's mm -hmm. the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, scary question. I expect the answer. Oh, I'm sorry. But, but <laughs> during, like during the time we had alcohol prohibition, uh -huh. was there anything similar to the single convention? Or was there anything similar to burn grants where police got grants? The more drug arrests and the more drug crime fighting, was there anything similar to burn grants or the single convention during alcohol prohibition? Excuse me. Um, what influence, if any, uh, you think the increasing privatization of the prison industry and the military and the police has had like a global level in the drug war? Privatization. Well, as I said in my talk, it's the United States military that's uh, been mostly involved, although they did at one point try to contract out, uh, at least in Afghanistan, probably in Colombia too, to like DynCor and other uh, private, um, basically, I mean, what do you call them, you know, um, armies for, for hire, they're, they're privatized armies. Um, I wanted to just say something about um, the... I, I believe that the war on drugs, it gets the United States and other countries that fight it enormous benefits. For the United States, it allows them to intervene all around the world. The Drug Enforcement Administration has like 97 offices in 97 countries. It allows them to go in and have influence in that country. And because we're not at the point yet where we have been able to fight effectively against the demonization of people who are involved in the drug trade and people who use drugs, it, it's enormously divisive. And we see that in the United States. I mean, it's all about racism in the United States. So they're able to divide people and make people think it's the drug users or it's the narco terrorists in Afghanistan. And so that is enormously ideologically powerful. And I don't believe that the US government will give that up without a massive struggle. And that's, um, or at least give it up in, in to the point where actually people's lives improved. I want to talk about um, Portugal just for a minute. I went to Portugal last year and I was there for a month and I met with um, the people who helped to craft um, the, um, their drug policy. So 10 years ago, they decriminalized all drug use. That's crack cocaine, heroin, meth, you name it. Anybody can have up to 10 days worth of drugs. And if the police um, decide to arrest you or whatever, and you have less than 10 days, it's actually an administrative offense. It's not a criminal offense. So, so they have taken drug use out of the realm of the criminal justice system in Portugal and put it in the realm of public health. And it was really interesting when I, when I interviewed some of these guys, they were saying, you know, when we started talking about changing our drug policy, the International Narcotics Control Board got wind of it. They flew to Lisbon and they said, hold on a minute here. You're not, you're not going to legalize drugs. They had thought about, they, they wanted to go as far as they could. They had thought about going outside the convention. But then the INCB came and then Portuguese uh, officials said, we can't risk what could happen to us if we go outside. So then they said, we're going to go as far as we can. And so then the INCB flew back to Vienna, wherever they, they live. And so then they put into place this amazingly progressive, the most progressive. It doesn't get a lot of press in the United States, but um, so it's an administrative offense. And what ends up happening is you get some sort of a ticket and you go in front of the Commission for the Dissuasion of Drug Use. This is a panel of people that social workers, psychologists, lawyers, sociologists, you go in front of this commission. It's not adversarial at all. The social worker does a, a, um, a psychological assessment to find out, are you a recreational user? Are you, what, what are you using? And then, you know, they make a recommendation together. And most of the time, the person accepts it. The majority of people who come before the commissions of dissuasion are people who use marijuana. And so I think Portugal is a poor example because it gives li gives lie to the idea that if you decriminalize drugs, all of a sudden everybody will go out and start using. They'll want to inject heroin. They'll want to, you know, start um, smoking crack. They've got 
um, over a little over 10 years out now of studies to show that there was a small increase in recreational drug use, mostly marijuana, but they don't have a huge problem with heroin injection. In fact, it went down. So Portugal gives live the idea, and I think this is the drug warrior's trump card, if we decriminalize or legalize, all of a sudden, everybody's going to go out and use, we're going to have a horrible addiction problem, our children are going to be addicted. It's not true. So I think Portugal is an example that we need to use. The last thing is I think we have to build a social movement in this country um, to, to legalize or even decriminalize drugs. And I think Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, is really, really important to cracking, cracking through the, the lies and the myths. And that's what she's calling for, that a, a movement on the level of, like, the civil rights, because that's how demonized and racist this war is. Now, is that easy? No. Right? Is it easy to build that kind of a movement? But I don't think we have an alternative. I don't think... The presidents of Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, if they don't have a movement of people in those countries to push them and hold their feet to the fire, the U.S., Russia, whoever, they're going to come down like a ton of bricks and say, you're not going to do this. We'll do sanctions. We won't give you economic aid. They'll do everything they can. So I think we need a movement. I think we have the beginnings of one. I want to relate it to Occupy. Um, you know, that movement for social justice, I think um, drugs have to be a central part of that, like all the other social justice issues that we're fighting in this country. So that's what I think some of us have to do is build that movement. Is it easy? No. Is there a shortcut to that? I, I just don't think politicians, you know, if we just vote for them or lobby them, I don't think that's enough to move them to do the right thing. They don't care that people die. How many people overdose every, every year in this country? I mean, people should not die of drug overdose. Even that has been a huge struggle. And you use the word glacial. I kind of like that word, glacial, a glacial pace. I think it's a, a, a real movement could push that glacier a, lot, a hell of a lot faster. And I would add to that 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 movement should be international, more international collaboration. Do you have anything else to say? I think we're pretty much out of time. Do you want to go ahead? on what the experiment in Portugal on either trying to explain from other places had other problems we're talking about. It's they ignore it. Yeah, so yeah. It's basically none. It's sort of I mean, we talk about Mexico. It doesn't come up at all in Vienna. Uh, any what you the only reaction you get is someone like the honorable gentleman from Pakistan saying, please do not legalize drugs. Um, and it's sort of reflected back that way as opposed to... They, they, there are side events, which Heather talked about, which are just basically either put on by governments where they won't talk about this or they put on by civil society where we do talk about it. But it's very hard to get governments to show up to those things. But it, it's, it's weird. It, it's, like I said, it's just an alternative reality where what's happening out there doesn't show up there except in really coded diplomatic terms. Um, and it's that's that, but next year it's shopped in some other way, um, but not not in the language that we use. They just don't, they don't they, they don't use direct, honest, open language. They it's all language of diplomacy. Portugal is interesting because the drug war doesn't it didn't play the same role in Portugal as it does in other countries. So they didn't need a drug war to divide people and to find scapegoats for society's problems. So that that is very and I don't maybe other countries in Europe they don't need the drug war. It doesn't function the way that it does in the United States. So that's something that was very different. So there wasn't actually a huge social movement from below in Portugal to get the de decriminalization scheme that they have. Um, they, didn't ha they didn't have that. And it, it's also interesting, the, the church, which is very powerful in Portugal, they didn't oppose it either. Um, so I don't think that we can get what they have in Portugal in the United States and other places without, without that movement. So I just want to make that clear. The, well, um, one of the things that, that happened at this, talking about change, and this is, these changes are so almost insignificant. But like four years ago, it's, you have the plenary situation. It, it's every single day, all throughout the whole five days of this meeting, pe members of government speak. And that's why even Morales was the highest ranking person, so he spoke first. Gil Kolakowski probably spoke about ninth or tenth. Um, and a few years ago, someone from civil society was able to speak, but they were the last person on the last day, and no one listened, and they all got up and left. 
But this time it moved forward so that Elia Albers, who is the executive director of the International Network of People Who Use Drugs, spoke on a Wednesday, and which is, you could say, is progress. Uh, except his statement, which he had to submit, was actually censored by them. Um, and he was told that he couldn't say, they said his language was, his, what he was saying was shocking. Um, but he went ahead and said it anyway, and then he was censored, or censured. Um, but the, it goes to, you, if you go to UN AIDS meetings, you will have people living with AIDS speaking at the meetings. They will be one of the first speakers that looked at, you, you can't end HIV epidemic in this world without involving people with HIV. But somehow we can end the war on drugs without involving people who use drugs in the dialogue. Um, and that's clearly ridiculous. So part of what we try and do over there is insert the voices of people who use drugs. And one of the most bizarre meetings I was ever at was, was we were putting together this political declaration. And it, was, it was everyone. It was drug-free America. It was special narcotics prosecutors and cops from California. And it, the conversation was, should you include people who use drugs as, should they be the most affected population? Well, then that calls. Uh, well, no, you can't. You have to. If you do that, then you have to include orphans in Colombia. You have to include customs officials. So then we went out and had this whole discussion with Drug Free America, uh, narcotics cops, uh, drug treatment programs from Italy, talking to international network of people who use drugs, the harm reduction coalition, um, drugs are from Vancouver, and. And you listen, the dialogue's going on, and the narcotics cops are saying, we will never talk to people who use drugs. And I'm thinking, you are talking to people who use drugs. <laughs> who do you think you're negotiating with right now? <laughs> and it's this bizarre thing about what, who is a person who uses drugs. As far as they're concerned, it's some irrationally mentally ill person who lives under a bridge and smokes crack and whatever. Uh, you know, that's their definition of a person who uses drugs. And Elliot, at this meeting, because you, the dialogue is always, if you use drugs, you are a victim. Uh, and if you supply drugs, you are a victimizer. And Elliot stood up and said, you know what, I'm, I'm fully employed, I have a PhD, I inject morphine every day. What is wrong with me? And uh, the question went unanswered. Um, but it's like our presence there forces that dialogue. And so, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we are um, well over time. So I guess we'll end on that note. Anybody have any last burning desires? <laughs> okay.